Well, thank you for joining us for Almost Persuaded. My name is Alan Hall, the pastor of Good News Free Will Baptist Church in York, Pennsylvania. If you have your Bibles today, if you'll turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, and we'll read our text here in just a few moments. We'll be begin reading in verses 22 through uh, 24. Had a teacher in high school named Mrs. Dilda. Now, I, I'd be quite honest with you, I, I didn't like Mrs. Dilda very much when I first met her. Uh, she was a, a very strict uh, teacher. Uh, she was uh, hard. She was tough. Uh, she graded every single student on their ability uh, rather than you know the actual test or the actual paper. And she expected you to give your very best and and what you did. And and then the to top it all off, she was my English teacher, which <laughs> wasn't one of my favorite uh, subjects in school. But, uh, you know, looking back, she was probably one of the best teachers I ever had. And to be quite honest with you, she is one of the dearest friends that I have uh, today. Whenever uh, I go back to the area that I grew up in, I, I, when I get a chance, I'll, I'll go by and, and, and talk with her. But I don't know if you had a Mrs. Dilda in your life or not, uh, an English teacher like that. But if you did, you knew that you couldn't turn in a paper uh, with a sentence which ended with a preposition, uh, unless it was enclosed in quotation marks. Uh, you know, every once in a while I'll, I'll hear someone say, well, such and such is to die for. Well, th this kind of has become a modern cliche, I guess, but that statement breaks one of the cardinal rules that Miss Dilda taught us that we couldn't do. Uh, I mean, such and such might be something for which to die, but it's not something to die for because you, you can't end it with a preposition. Now, an exception to that rule, as I mentioned earlier, was if you put it in quotation marks. In other words, let's just say there's two teenage girls and they're at the mall and they see this pair of shoes and, oh, it's exactly what they've been looking for, exactly what they've been waiting for. And one says to the other one, oh, those pair of shoes, they are to die for. Now, if I was writing a paper for Mrs. Dilda, and I was writing the story of these two girls, and I put that in quotation marks as one of those blonde teenage girls said to her friend, that is to die for, then that was okay. Then, you know, I, I would have been all right as far as my, my grade was concerned. Otherwise, if I didn't put it in quotation marks, then that grade just fell from a B minus or a B plus to a B minus, all because of that one misplaced preposition. Well, with that in mind, the title of the message today is A Gospel to Die For. Um, I, now, I could say it that way because, first of all, I'm saying it for emphasis. All right, That was one of the things she taught us. Another thing uh, that Mrs. Dilda taught us was that if you knew the rules of grammar, you got to know them first, but if you knew the rules of grammar then in your writing and your speaking, then it's okay sometimes to break those rules of grammar. So there, enough said. I know that was a long thing, a long way to go around just saying the title of the message. But the, a gospel to die for is what we're going to be talking about. Here, here in our text, Paul is rushing toward Jerusalem. He is trying to get there as fast as possible. He's trying to make it in time for Pentecost. Because in, in Paul's mind, there's going to be people from every nation there in Pentecost, and he wants to be there so that he can witness to them, so he can preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he is trying his best to get there, but along the way, he is visiting uh, different cities, visiting different folks that he has won personally to the Lord, and some that he has been won um, because of his uh, preaching in an indirect way, but every city that he goes to, not only is he visiting, but he is being warned by these people. Don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. Stay away from Jerusalem. They want to kill you there. They want to persecute you. They want to stone you, Paul. They want to make you an example. But I want you to notice his response to those warnings. Here in our text, Acts chapter 20, verse 22. He says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, it, It's not my choice to go there. It's, it's not about Paul. The reason that I'm going to Jerusalem is because the Holy Spirit is telling me to go there. 
He is directing my life in that direction. And, and he says, so I'm going bound. I have already relinquished control to the Holy Spirit. So I've got to go. I'm bound by the Holy Spirit to do what he tells me to do. He says, not knowing, verse 22 says, the things that shall befall me there. In other words, I don't know what to expect when I get there, but I'm going there anyway. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things move me. What things, Paul? These things that these folks were warning them about. Persecution and death and, and the stoning and ridicule and all these things. He says, they don't, they don't trouble me. They don't bother me. Uh, he says, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have now received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, my life is not as important to me as being able to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's what's important. That's what I get up for in the morning. That's what I live for is to tell others about the gospel, the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, it's clear that the gospel of Jesus was something that Paul was willing to die for. He says it in those words. Now, those two teenage girls that I mentioned earlier in the mall, they probably are not going to actually die for physically die for those pair of shoes. I have heard about people being robbed for their shoes and, you know, uh, their shoes being taken away from them. But, you know, there's relatively very few things in this life that I'd be willing to lay down my life for. How about you? I mean, can you think of any? I, I, I think of my family. You know, I'd be willing to lay down my, wife, uh, my life for my wife. For, for my little girl, my family, the, my friends, those that are close to me. I, there are certain principles that I'd be willing to lay down my life for. Now, not all principles would I be willing to do that for, but some I would. When it comes down to it, it's not the temporal things, really, that I'd lay down my life for. It's those things that are going to matter in eternity. That's what's important, and that's what Paul was saying here. He says, I'm willing to die for what's really important so that others can hear the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, there, there are a lot, he, he said he was willing to die for the gospel. There, there are a lot of things in this world that people call the gospel that aren't necessarily the gospel. For example, there, there are some that would, they equate the gospel with the truth. And, and they think that those two things are the same thing. Uh, for example, uh, let's just say a person is talking to another one and he is sharing with them some ugly piece of gossip. And he says to them, now I, I promise I, what I'm telling you is the gospel. Now, that's not really the gospel, is it? Uh, although the gospel is the truth, not all truth is the gospel. Gospel means good news. And it comes uh, to us from two old English words. Uh, the Greek word, uh, euangelion, that means evangelism, which is sharing the good news of the gospel. But even with that, not every evangelist, not every person who claims to be preaching and teaching the gospel is actually teaching the gospel. Uh, let, let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at what ha was happening during Paul's time. Galatians chapter 1. Turn there in your Bibles, if you would. Galatians chapter 1. And Paul describes the gospel that he is preaching, and then he describes what others were preaching during that time. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me into the churches of Galatia. Grace be unto you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now notice what he says next. I marvel... In other words, I'm amazed that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ, unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be 
accursed. You know what Paul was talking about here? Paul was going around and winning people to Christ by preaching the gospel of Christ, the truth of God's Word, what salvation really is. But then there was a group of people coming behind Paul, and they were trying to add to salvation. In other words, they were saying, you Gentiles, you, you, you folks that are not Jews, before you actually can become a Christian, I know you say you're a Christian now because you put faith in Christ, but that's not enough. You have to become a Jew first. In other words, you've got to convert to Judaism before you can know Christ as your Savior. Now, is that what the gospel said? Not at all. Uh, God accepts us for the way that we are. And we come to Him, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. They even said, look, before you can become a Christian, you've got to commit to doing all the ceremonies and, and the laws and observe the rites of what Moses taught us in the Old Testament. In other words, add these works to your salvation, then you can be saved. That's not what the gospel was all, was all about then. It's not what the gospel was all about today. Again, it is for by grace are you saved through faith. Uh, there's a lot that are called their message the gospel, but not, it's not the gospel. It's another gospel which is not really the gospel at all. You know, the world has many theories. Man has many theories of what it takes to get forgiveness of sins. Uh, and, and they say, well, this is the gospel. But when it's not the Bible gospel, then they're not the gospel at all. A gospel which says that you must be baptized in order to enjoy forgiveness is a false gospel. It's a lie. Any gospel which demands that you become the member of some church is not really the gospel. A gospel which advocates, and by the way, over the next few weeks and months and even year, you're going to hear a lot about what I'm about to tell you right now. But a gospel which advocates collective salvation rather than individual salvation is not the gospel. We come to Christ one-on-one. -on -one. We don't come to Christ as a group to try to atone for our sins. Any gospel that teaches salvation by any other means other than what the Bible says is a lie. Now, Pastor Hall didn't say that. Jesus said that. The Apostle Paul said that. And Paul calls it this gospel that he is preaching, the gospel of the Bible, the gospel of the grace of God. Now I want us to notice several things about this gospel today. First of all, notice it's a gospel that we don't deserve. We don't deserve this gospel that's offered to us. This gospel is a gospel of grace. Now, any good news that's not saturated with grace is not really that good a news. Let me give you an example. Several years ago, there were some TV ads that would run over and over again, and there was different commercials, but it was for the same company. And it would always show a, a, a person who was in dire straits. They needed some help of some kind. They needed someone to come along to help them solve the situation that they were in. And then someone would come along and they'd say, well, you know what, I've got some good news for you. And it wasn't the good news they wanted to hear, of course. Now, I can't do anything about your situation, they would say, but here is the good news. I saved a bunch of money on my car insurance by switching to whatever it was. Now, what an illustration that there is good news and then there's the gospel. I'm, I'm thankful that that guy saved money on his car insurance. But that's not the news that that person needed to hear. You see, where, where there's no grace, and there was no grace in those insurance ads, where there's no grace, it's not that good of news. It really can't help that person that needs help. You see, true grace is an act of unmerited favor. In a biblical sense, it's where God, whereby He, he mercifully chooses to not judge us, not punish us. But on the flip side of that coin, He gives us the gifts and the blessings and the benefits that really only Jesus Christ deserves. That's what grace is all about. You know, out of grace, God the Son, Jesus, chose to bear that judgment that belonged to us. He, he chose to experience the punishments that should have belonged to us.
He did that out of grace. It was grace that motivated God to send His only begotten Son to the world, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It was because of that grace Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. It was because of, or through that grace that Christ also hath loved us and hath given Himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Let me uh, show you the words of Paul here. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and look down in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places. Notice the next two words, in Christ. We don't deserve these things that God gives us, but it's because of Christ that we experience these blessings. He continues, verse 4, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace." Look over in chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, in other words, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you are saved. It's by the grace of God that we receive this gospel. Grace, the unmerited favor, uh, the, the acrostic for grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. We didn't pay for that, but we were given that grace, this gospel by God because He loved us. So the gospel of grace is the good news about the unmerited favor of God. The gospel of grace is the good news that Jesus died on the cross as a substitute for us so that we could be saved. We don't deserve it, but God gives it, offers it to us anyway. Number two, it's a gospel we don't deserve. Number two, it's a gospel we cannot earn. Paul writes in Romans, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you hear that word gift? You know, a gift is something that you don't earn. If you have to earn a gift, then it's not really a gift, is it? It's, it's wages, it's compensation, it's not a gift. Well, you know, sinners, that's us, that's all of us, every single one of us, there's none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. Sinners deserve to die. Sinners deser deserve uh, to, to die the second death, which is, uh, which is hell, eternal punishment. But the grace of God means that Christ took that punishment. He took our hell for us. So by the grace of God, those who are her sinners, you and me, Jesus says, you know what? You don't have to experience hell. I've already experienced it for you. You don't have to experience the punishments, uh, the penalty for sin. I've already paid it. I've already taken that for you. And so because Jesus saves us, we will not, we cannot be cast into the lake of fire, which is second death. Now, you might be thinking, if this is maybe relatively new to you, I, I thought everybody was going to die, even Christians. That's true. Unless the Lord uh, uh, comes back very soon, every single one of us is going to leave this world through the portal of death. We're all going to die physically, but, you know, the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. That's talking about the physical death. But after this, the judgment. Now, that's where the grace of God comes in, the judgment. You see, whether God says you get to enter into the glories of heaven, you're, you go in on my right hand, or you get to experience the eternal punishments of hell, you go by my left that all is dependent on the grace that's applied to our account at judgment, isn't it? Now, it's important for us to understand we can't earn that grace. In fact, we can't do anything to get it. Paul says, Romans 11, verse 6, that if salvation by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. In other words, salvation uh, comes to us 
has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with God. Matter of fact, it's God's grace that comes to us long before we ever repent. Long before we ever bow our heads and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Long before we ever ask for forgiveness, God's grace is there. It's God's grace that allows us the opportunity to be saved. It is God's grace that allows us to hear His gospel preached or read. It is God's grace that He sends the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts so that we'll be receptive to His Word. Jesus didn't leave salvation up to us. Aren't you thankful for that? We'd have messed it all up, wouldn't we? No, He lived a sinless life. He died a vicarious death. He took the punishment of the wrath of God. He became our substitute. He paid the penalty of sin. He overcame the first death and the second death. He provided the only way to heaven. You, see, you hear a pattern there? It's all about Him. It has nothing to do with us. The gospel of the grace of God is provided solely by Him. We can't earn it. So first of all, it's a gospel we don't deserve. Secondly, it's a gospel we cannot earn. Thirdly, it's a gospel we should die for. Paul says in Acts 21, verse 13, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of Lord Jesus. Back in our text in verse 24, he says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Paul was prepared to physically die for the gospel of grace. Why? Because he was a recipient of that gospel of grace. Back in Acts chapter 9, go back and read that sometime. It, it tells us what Paul was like before he got saved. Before he met Christ, he was a hater of Christians, a persecutor of Christians. Now, when he was on the road to Damascus that day to go kill some more Christians, he wasn't looking for the grace of Christ. He wasn't looking for Christ at all. Matter of fact, he didn't know he even needed the grace of God. But God in His mercy reached out to Paul and He bestowed upon him that grace. He gave him the opportunity to know His Son. And with that, he no longer was a hater of Christians because God made him a new creature. He became, because he had a new heart, he became a, an apostle for Christ, a preacher, a proclaimer for Him. Now, he wasn't saved because he deserved it. He wasn't saved because he earned it. He was saved because the gospel was a gospel of grace. Now, here in Acts chapter 20, we find Paul testifying, as it tells us in verse 21, of the gospel of grace. He was bearing witness, it says, to something about he had personal knowledge. He knew what he was talking about. He had experienced the salvation that he was speaking forth to these folks. Now, he was willing to die for that salvation. Just as Christ died for us to give us this salvation. He was willing to die for that gospel so that others could know what he had experienced. You see, Paul realized that without repentance to God, without seeking his forgiveness, there is no salvation. There is no salvation in any other. So it was absolutely necessary that Paul go to Ephesus and preach this message. It was absolutely necessary that Paul did get to Jerusalem and later to Rome to proclaim this message. Because how were people going to know what they needed to do unless somebody told them? Is that not still true today? How are people going to know that they're sinners unless we tell them? Tell them what the Bible says. How are people going to know what to do about that sin unless we tell them? And Paul says, even if it means losing my life, then that's something I'm willing to do. You know, I believe that Paul would have suffered just about anything to see people trust Christ. Matter of fact, he wrote these words. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Romans 9, he says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bury me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul wasn't going to let anything stop him when it came to sharing the good news of the gospel with others. Let me ask you a question. What would stop you from sharing the gospel with others? Let's go a step further. What does stop you from sharing the gospel with others?
You know, Paul's determination came shining through when he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. But that was Paul. What about you? Are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Are you willing to do anything in order to share the gospel with others? You know, I'm thinking about personal relationship with Christ. Are you trusting Him as your Savior? I think about sharing the gospel with others. Are you living the gospel out in front of others? Are you taking the opportunities that God gives you and sharing the gospel with those that God puts in your path? Or are those those times in your life where you keep silent, where you are ashamed of the gospel of Christ? You don't want to make any waves. You don't want to endure any ridicule. You're scared of what somebody might say. Let me tell you a true story. There were 40 soldiers. All 40 of these soldiers uh, were Christians. They were a part of uh, the famed 12th Legion of Rome's Imperial Army. And one day their captain told them that the emperor had sent an edict out for all of the soldiers to offer a sacrifice to the pagan gods. In other words, get your sacrifice together. I want you to bow down to the pagan gods. Well, these soldiers replied in unison. They came together with their response. They said, you can have our armor and even our bodies, but our heart's allegiance belongs to Jesus Christ. Wow. Can you imagine telling the emperor that? You can have everything else. We'll fight for you. We'll do what... You but you can't have our heart because our heart belongs to Jesus Christ. Well, during that midwinter, A.D. 320, the captain of that army marched his army, these 40 men, out on a nearby frozen lake. And he told them to take all their clothes off. He stripped them of all their clothes. Freezing temperatures now. Frozen lake. Wind blowing. Marched them out to the center of that lake. And he said, you'll stand here until you're ready to renounce your faith in Christ. When you're ready, just make your way over to the bank, bow down before me, and renounce your faith, and we'll let you live. All through the night as the wind was howling over that frozen lake and the men stood there huddled together, shivering, they began to sing the song, 40 martyrs for Christ, 40 martyrs for Christ, and of course that echoed out over the lake. One by one, as the temperature began to drop even lower, one by one dropped down to the ice, and they lost their life. At last, there was only one man left. He lost his courage, and he stumbled across the ice to the shore, and he bowed before his captain, and he renounced his faith in Christ so that he could live. Well, the officer of the guard, unbeknown to everybody else, had watched the whole thing. He secretly had become a believer in Christ. When he saw this last man break rank, he walked out on the ice, he threw his clothes off, and he confessed that he was a Christian. But when the sun rose up that next morning, there were 40 soldiers who had died for the gospel of Christ. Why would they do something like that? Why would they give their life for that when they could have just renounced Christ and lived? I'll tell you why. Because the gospel is a gospel to die for. Are you dying daily for that gospel? It's a question each one of us must answer.